Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I love being in Tyler. I love our bishop. I love the people at the St. Philip Institute and the diocese. I love these students from Bishop Gorman. Um, uh, it's wonderful that we were able to bring this here to our area to have this kind of a discussion. It's wonderful that you would get up on a Saturday and come. Um, what I want to cover is a little bit of history because this is a history that is not well known. It is not taught in schools. There was actively a movement to hide this history about the Catholic Church several um, decades and 100 years ago. Um, and I want to make sure that you know it because we live in a moment in time where a lot of people think there's a conflict between science and religion. It's why we're having events like this. But there never was before. There never was. In the history of the Catholic Church, science came from our worldview. And so I want to make sure that everyone here knows about this history because it blows away all the dust and cobwebs off that tired old conflict myth. And it needs to, this is our, this is our heritage as Catholics. And so it's very important that as Catholics we understand this. I'm going to cover about 4,000 years of history in less than an hour, so I'm going to go fast. Um, the main thing I want you to take away from this is that these facts and this information exist, okay? So just try to follow along because my title is called Completing the Scientific Revolution. So think of a revolution like in physics, a circle, and we're going to talk about going around this circle. You have to start from a place of understanding what my first book was called Science Was Born of Christianity, this title, because it's such a shocking claim. But it's the truth. Science was born of Christianity. And what that means is the reason we have modern science at all today is because of the Catholic worldview. It was Catholic long before, I mean, it was Christian and Catholic were the same thing for most of history since Christ. Um, so, born of Christianity, born of the Catholic worldview. Dr. Barr talked about that worldview in the last hour, about seeing the world as creation. And I don't think that today we have a strong enough appreciation for the theology of creation, for how important it is that we do see the world as creation, as opposed to what? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit in, in my circle here. We see God as the origin of all, outside of time, eternal, uncreated. We see creation as having a beginning in time, because God told us that. That is de fede dogma. That is divine revolution, revelation. We see that the world had a beginning in time and that the world was created. But to appreciate the radicalness of that view, we have to go way back in antiquity. In the ancient cultures, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient India, ancient Babylonia, ancient Mesopotamia, all of those religions had some form of pantheism. What is pantheism? It's basically nature <coughs> worship. But it makes sense if you don't know about Christ, and they didn't then. If you don't know about Christ, and you look out at the order and beauty and lawfulness in the natural world, the sun rises and sets, people, there's a cycle of life, there's a cycle of the seasons, there's a cycle in your, reprodu in your, your digestive system and, and reproduction. If all you see in nature is cycle upon cycle upon cycle, and you're searching for God, because we're made to search for God, so it's only natural that all human cultures have searched for God. You would conclude, as all these other ancient cultures did, that the world is some eternally cycling cosmos. It's all just one big endless cycle going over and over and over again. Without getting into each detail of the ancient religions, they all held to some form of that belief. Pantheism. There was a pantheistic aspect in all the ancient religions. Egypt, ancient China, I think I left that one out. 
Babylon, Mesopotamia, India, Greece, even in Arabia with the Islamic cultures and their worldview, there was not enough of a refutation of pantheism. So imagine your mindset. Forget everything you know about being Christian and just try to imagine the view of these peoples back then. You look out at the cycles in nature, the cycles in life, and you conclude that the world is one big organism, that the world is God, that there are gods that come from the world, right? Like the animism, like the Egyptians deifying animal-human hybrids, worshiping animals. If you saw that, you would think the world is one big cycling cosmos, but think what that does to the individual human person. If you're born in a golden era, good for you. Enjoy your life. You were born there. If you're born at the bottom of a cycle when there's despair and suffering, what can you do to change it? You're just like a spoke in a wheel. You're born at some point in history that you can't change, and you can't progress the human race because there's nothing you can do. There is a resignation to the cosmic treadmill. All these cultures, and, I, and, I, and my first book, Science Was Born of Christianity, which is based on a priest who is also a physicist and a theologian and a historian and a philosopher, Father Stanley Yockey, <coughs> He dug up all of this information from the ancient cultures in their writings. So we're not just speculating. It's in their hymns, in their, their, their writings, their ancient uh, religious writings. Back in the days when the Firestone Library at P Princeton had three and four hundred year old original documents out in the open, he did this research and I, I verified as much as I could of it um, when I was home w raising five little kids. <laughs> My husband said, you can spend the money to, to verify Yaki sources if that's what makes you happy. And I couldn't travel, but I could um, look up stuff on the internet. Anyway, um, <laughs> there, there is some truth to this story. But the point for you now is the biblical worldview, the ancient Jewish worldview, the Hebrews our Christian worldview that God created the world is radically different from any other religious worldview in antiquity and even still now. It's radically different, okay? Why? Because of creation. And we know this. If you pray the creed when you go to Mass, and you do, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. It's throughout the, the Bible Starting with Genesis 1, <laughs> in the beginning, the beginning of time, God created the heavens and earth. Proverbs, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work. Me in this section is wisdom. This is the part of Proverbs that's talking about wisdom's part in creation. It goes, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. Talking about wisdom. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hill, hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields of the world's first bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, and when he made from firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, and when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him, wisdom, like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. That's in Proverbs. It's a very scientific passage. In Ephesians, in the New Testament, blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. And I can go on and on. And if you listen for it in Mass or when you're reading the Bible, you will see pervasively in everything we believe 
thanking God for creation. There is no pantheism in the Christian faith. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighted the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Very scientific. Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. I like to say that science is the study of the handiwork of God. And when you understand science that way, no myth, no conflict. Form the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So, it's thorough, okay? Now, what happened in the history of science long before? So, when you talk about the history of science with most people, we start with the modern, the revolution, the scientific revolution, modern science, the 16th and 17th centuries. I'm way, way back. We're going much deeper into history. Because none of those cultures that had pantheistic beliefs, pantheistic worldviews, none of the cultures that saw the world as eternally cycling, saw the world as an organism, saw nature as worthy of being deified, none of those cultures gave birth to modern science. Modern science, it's, it's, it's in every history book you read, but it's not often appreciated. Modern science was born in the Catholic universities in the Middle Ages. That's where Galileo came from. That's where Newton was in that culture. He wasn't Catholic. But that worldview was handed on to them because that's what they believed. That's fundamentally how they saw the world. And they said, I wonder how God's handiwork works. I wonder if I can figure it out. They weren't surprised that it was mathematical. The Church Fathers, though, just like Dr. Barr showed you some quotes, and there are many, many, many more, like he said. It, this was one of the biggest things. When the Church Fathers were refuting um, the, the Hellenistic Greeks and they were refuting some of the Greek thought, that's one thing they refuted. The world is not eternally cycling. The world has a beginning in time. And they thoroughly refuted that, that because and I'll get into why, but because it's one of the tenets, it's one of the most fundamental aspects of our Christian faith. They also rejected the eternity of the world on philosophical grounds. Like I said, there's no free will if the world is eternally cycling. You're born into whatever time period you're born into, and there's nothing you can do about it. And whatever you're doing, if the world is eternally cycling, all of us sitting here has happened an infinite number of times already and will happen an infinite number of times in the future. Every possible conceivable instance happens over and over. That's the consequence philosophically of believing that the cosmos is just eternally cycling. And that's what you're left with without the revelations of Christ. That's why divine revelation, it's not just something we do at Mass on Sundays or daily. It's something that changes the way we live. It's something that changes the way we understand ourselves and our place in the world. So it's, it's, it's philosophically not sound, it's theologically not sound because God revealed to us that in the beginning he created the heavens and the earth. It, so it contradicts scripture, it con contradicts the theology, it contradicts philosophy. That's one of the reasons the early church fathers refuted pantheism. Okay, so there's a lot of quotes here I have these in my book, Science Was Born of Christianity, and I have them, if you just look online, I have lots of essays um, with this stuff there that you can just freely access. Even on my website, stacytresankos.com, I have them listed on um, the page where the book, Science Was Born of Christianity, um, it is. But I just want to call your attention to some things, just to convince you of what I'm saying. In St. Justin Martyr, in the second century, we're way back, 100 A.D. to 165, he was telling the Stoics, the ancient Greeks, they teach that even God himself shall be resolved into fire, and they, they, they say that the world is to be formed anew by this revolution. But we understand God, the creator of all things, is superior to things that change. He's uncreated. In his second apology, for they say that human actions come to pass by faith. They will maintain either that God is nothing else than the things which are ever turning and altering and dissolving into the same things, 
that neither vice nor virtue is anything. So they're denying, he, he's, he's refuting this, if you have a spiritual soul and intellect and free will, then you have to practice virtue. And Christians don't say the world is eternally cycling. We say that we are born in a universe that has a beginning in time and that we in our life, or, sorry, get a little excited, we in our life are supposed to journey in faith and we're supposed to help the human race progress during our lifetimes. The whole human race is on a journey. Clement of Alexandria in the third century, same thing. He said, why pray do you infect life with idols, imagining winds, air, fire, earth, stock, stones, iron, this world itself to be God's? He said, we don't believe that. How great is the power of God. His mere will is creation. For God alone created, since he alone is truly God. Let none of you worship the sun. Let no one deify the universe. Rather, let him seek after the creator of the universe. That's the difference in the Christian worldview that is different from every other religious worldview. There's a big difference between thinking the world is God and thinking the world is created by God. Origin, same time period, early on. He said, besides, if the world is eternally cycling, then Adam and Eve came around again and again and again. Christ died again and again and again. That's also, we have none of that in the Christian faith. Reject it. No, not there. There was a lot from Greek philosophy that Christians kept. Um, if you study the history of the early church fathers, there was a lot of it they kept, but they rejected the things that contradicted divine revelation. And again, this was what Christ revealed to us. This is what Scripture revealed to us. You can't look at the world and use reason alone and figure out there was a beginning in time. That had to be revealed to us. Um, and down here, um, the Greeks talked about the logos, the, the rationality in the world. So the ancient Greeks saw that there was order. And they thought, you know, this cosmic order of eternal cycles was the source of that order. They didn't really know where it came from, and they had different opinions on it. But again, it was rejected by the early Christians. Up into the 4th and 5th century, St. Augustine of Hippo, same thing. Everything is created by God, the Creator. God made it good. God is uncreated. And going along with the eternal cycles leads you into evil ways because it denies free will. It denies our obligation to practice virtue. The wicked walk in a circle, he said. Not because their life is to recur by means of these cir circles, which these philosophers imagine, but because the path in which their false doctrine now runs is circuitous. He was very, that was a little polemic, but he's saying it just doesn't make any sense. The ancient Greeks had this concept of the great year. So what does this have to do with science? Aristotle had this concept of antiperistasis. The ancient Greeks had this idea, not all of them, but Aristotle did, that, talking about physics now, science, just natural things. When you throw a ball, how many of you have had physics and had to calculate projectile motion? Some of you? It's so fun. <laughs> and, and, you can, and you can go out and throw a ball and hope the wind's not blowing and your calculations will work. But <laughs> they had this idea of motion, though in the in, in antiquity. And Aristotle saw the world as everything has a soul because the world is a living organism. Everything has a soul. Even in, inanimate things like rocks have souls. And everything has a desire to be in its resting place. In the heavens where the celestial bodies are, everything moves in perfect circles because again, they had great reverence for cycles. Everything moves in perfect circles, and the celestial bodies, you know, the moon looks like a perfect circle from here. They thought the moon was a perfect circle, a perfect sphere, the stars were perfect circles, and everything was moving in perfect circles, and they could sort of chart them and later figured out they actually weren't. But it looked like that to the, to the ancients. Everything's moving in perfect circles in the celestial sphere. 
in the terrestrial sphere down here, whereas perfect circles is the resting place for the celestial orbs, down here, the resting place is, where, if you drop a rock, where does it go? Down. So it's seeking the center of the earth. It's seeking its resting place. There has to be something in contact. They didn't believe in a void. And so there has to be something in contact. It's this divine ether out in the celestial um, realm. But on earth, if you throw a rock, you know that it arches. It goes down. Well, they said part of that's because the rock is trying to seek its resting place. The other part is antiperistasis. As the rock moves through the air, the air is actually being parted. That's the anti, it's, it's pushing against the air. The peri is that it's being parted. And the air is moving around in behind the rock and pushing it. That's anti-peristasis. Anti is the resistance, peri is the dividing. Stasis is moving in behind it, maintaining some kind of equilibrium to keep things in motion. There's no motion in a perfect vacuum, according to this line of thought. Well, this led Aristotle to say that if you have a small rock and a rock that's ten times bigger, and you drop them, the one that's bigger has more of a soul, a greater desire to be in the resting place. Which one should hit the ground faster? If you're thinking like this, which one would hit the ground faster? The big one. And, and he actually said that, that if you have something that's twice as big, it'll hit the ground, and it'll fall to the ground twice as fast. Now, this, Father Yaki put it like this, there was such a stranglehold in this way of looking at things that people have wondered why no one ever just dropped the rocks and said, oh wait, they hit at the same time. <laughs> because that's what they do. And, and I'm not, I, I won't do it in here, but I've done it for students before. Because even they'll, they'll look at it and they'll go, the big one will hit faster. It doesn't. If you drop them, they'll hit at the same time. Now, if you drop a feather and a cannonball, the cannonball will hit faster because there's air resistance. You've got to get into calculating other things. But they have shown in a perfect vacuum, if you drop a feather and a cannonball, they do fall at the same rate. So this was not noticed. And that, the point here is, is that when you get into this mindset, they didn't even notice something that would have been so easy to notice. Okay. Philoponus in, I hope I said that right. Did I say it right? Philoponus. I read and th say things in my head, and then when they come out of my mouth, they're not right. <laughs> um, but I live back in East Texas where everybody talks right, so I'm glad to be here. <laughs> after living in New York and uh, Massachusetts for 20-something years. That guy stated that he did notice, he did notice that all bodies would move in a vacuum at the same speed regardless of their weight, that bodies with different rates falling from the same height hit the ground at the same time, that projectiles move across the air not because air keeps, them, keeps closing in behind them, but he said because of some quantity of motion. So there was already some thought about this. Moving on up in time, the medieval scholars, so we, we just moved up a whole lot of centuries, they also rejected the eternity of the world because of divine revelation. Not so much because of science, but because of divine revelation, because of the reasons I said, free will, it's revealed in scripture that there is a beginning in time and that God created everything. The circular motion of the firmament, firmament and the stars as a projectile, similar to how a stone is thrown. Its impetus is ultimately due to the hold of the thrower against something solid. The key word here is impetus. This is leading up to something that we had in modern physics. I won't say the word yet, but this was called impetus theory. And it was being noticed that maybe antiperistasis isn't correct. Maybe there's not some Thing that's moving in behind and causing things to move. Maybe there's some other reason. Maybe there's a quantity of motion. St. Albert the Great, up into the um, 12th and 13th century, uh, he wrote, um, what was it called? He wrote a complete encyclopedia of the philosophical di disciplines at the time based on the Aristotelian texts. 
um, for his students of the Dominican order. And this is how he began it. So they, these scholars, even in the Middle Ages, some of the ancient Greek text came through the um, Islamic world and came to um, Christendom. And again, the scholars were doing the same thing as the church fathers had done. They were combing through the Greek scientific works, keeping what was good and true, because there was some truth there, but rejecting things that contradicted Christian tenets. And this was part of it. You see here this respect for creation, this absolute adherence to the world as created. Overcome by the request of certain of these brethren, we have undertaken this work, the, the big encyclopedia of philosophical thought at the time. First, to the praise of Almighty God, who is the fountain of wisdom and the creator, ordered and order, orderer and governor of nature. The Fourth Lateran Council affirmed this, and we pray it, creator of everything invisible and, vis and, and, and visible, meaning spiritual and material, and atomic. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas said, and, and this is, for me, it was a key point, to say that modern science was born of faith in what God revealed to us, faith in divine revelation. Modern science was not born of pantheism. Pantheism was, for those people, a rational conclusion looking at nature. You wouldn't find that there was a beginning of time scientifically. This was revealed to us by God. And St. Thomas Aquinas said, the articles of faith cannot be proved demonstratively. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth in which words the newness of the world is stated, beginning in time. Therefore, the newness of the world is known only by revelation. By faith alone do we hold, and by no demonstration can it be proved that the world did not always exist. We believe it because of faith. In 1277, the Bishop of Paris issued a list of 219 condemned propositions relating to the Aristotelian text. So they were combing through them, rejecting everything that contradicted Christian tenets. And many of those 219 propositions that were condemned had to do with eternally cycling cosmos, had to do with the pantheism worldview, had to do with um, the free will that we were talking about, had to do with the world being um, coming and going, eternally cycling. Um, and these were not binding on Catholics at the time, but they were condemned for the academic community of the time, um, and it made a difference. It absolutely rejected the things in the Aristotelian text that contradicted Christian creed. So that's why this is the next part of the cycle. Science was born of Christianity because faith gave the first breaths to modern science. Back to that impetus theory. E even though other scholars had talked about it, Father, he was a priest, Father Jean Buridan was the one who thoroughly refuted Aristotle's anti-peristasis. He used scientific reasoning, and he actually wrote a few papers on it that were very much like scientific papers today would be. And he said, wait a minute. If things only move because there's an anti-peristatic effect, then how come if you take a wheel that spins, like if you can spin it in one place, a spinning wheel, and you put a tent over it, how come it keeps spinning? It's spinning, there's no anti-peristatic effect on that wheel, and if you put a tent over it, there's no air flowing in or out, and it keeps moving. He had a lot of examples. Another example was a spinning top, like a child's toy. If you're spinning the top, it's moving, and it's not moving in a line, so there's no anti-peristatic effect, it's just spinning. He said, if you're standing on a boat, and if you stand at that front of the boat, and the boat's going through the water, the ship's going through the water, 
if all, that water, if all that air was rushing around and then pushing from behind, what you ought to feel is this enormous force pushing you forward. But what happens if you stand in the front of a boat? You're blown back. And he, he listed, there was another one I like, with the arrow. He said if you take an arrow and you throw it, the point is very sharp, and so it's parting the air. But if you were to put, take an arrow that was sharp at both ends, according to antiparastasis, it wouldn't go anywhere. Because when the air was parted in the front and came around to the back, it would just be parted again. But an arrow with, with a sharp end on both ends does go somewhere. You can throw it. So he said... It doesn't say in the Bible that antiperistasis has to be true. It could be that God made matter and made the world with forces that cause them to do the things they do. Maybe there's something in creation that's causing this. Maybe we need to look for some other answer. Besides, when you drop two rocks and they're different sizes, they hit the ground at the same time. Um, and so he, he had new words for it. God, when he created the world, moved each of the celestial bodies as he pleased. So they don't have to move in perfect circles. And in moving them, he impressed in them impetuses, which moved them without his having to move them anymore. Just like Dr. Barr's talk about, does God have to keep tinkering and keeping things moving, or could he create things to do what they're supposed to do? Same thing except by the method of general influence whereby he concurs as a co-agent in all things which take place. This is very much like what we say, that God created everything, but God also holds everything in existence, even the electrons and the orbitals in your body right now. He's holding things in existence. These papers were significant. Just to try to piece through the history here, Father Buridan became the rector of the university in Paris in 1327 and taught there for about three decades. So he was, he was significant at the University of Paris. He was the rector for three decades. In 1377, his theory of impetus was formally proposed by Nicole Odrium. So we're at 1320, 1325. We're getting closer to when people start talking about the history of modern science in the 1600s. It was destined, the, the theory of impetus was destined to be adopted by Albert of Saxony in 1316 to 1390. Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 to 1543, that's his lifetime. And Galileo. Now we're at the point where people usually start talking about modern science. And they credit Galileo as being the founder of modern science. Why? And then Sir, and Sir Isaac Newton. Um, who wasn't Catholic, but who was very devoutly religious and affected by this mindset. The scientific revolution is often defined, and, and it is, and anybody taking science classes knows this, it's defined as a change from quali qualitatively describing nature to quantifying nature. It's why physics students break pencils when they have to solve problems about the total kinetic energy of a rolling ball. After Galileo, so now I'm going to skip forward real fast because we're into the part that is usually described as the history of modern science. Um, <laughs> does anybody recognize this problem from physics class? <laughs> uh, kinetic linear and rotational kinetic energy and you have to do both and then you can simplify the equation. This came from the worldview that God created an ordered world. But that's how it started. It first started by so thoroughly refuting pantheism that they even formulated a new theory about motion. And that opened the doors for figuring out, which is one thing Galileo contributed greatly. Not only did he point a telescope up and see that the moon wasn't actually a celestial body that was made out of matter, just like things on Earth, he also started quantifying motion. Sir Isaac Newton quantified motion, his three laws of motion. He started quantifying motion. And it is that quantification of motion that now makes physics and chemistry and biology students break pencils and cry to their parents at night when they can't get their homework done because God created a world that is that ordered. 
You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and so I taught high school physics and chemistry for a while, and I used, and it was wonderful to be able, because if, if you're not a Catholic and you're teaching physics and chemistry, and I was, by the way, in Athens back in my 20s, I lived in Athens, Texas before I moved to the north, and I did teach chemistry. And I was 21, and my students were not much younger than me. It was the first thing I did out of college. And they would say, why do we have to learn chemistry? And I would say, because your parents make you come to school and you have to graduate. And I didn't have a good answer. And they're like, well, that's so not satisfying. I'm like, I know, but we have to do this. I really didn't have an answer for them. Like, I loved chemistry, but I couldn't make them love chemistry. Years later, when I taught chemistry and physics as a Catholic, why do I have to learn chemistry? Why do I have to learn physics? I'm never going to be a scientist. I hate this stuff. I don't want to learn it. I'm like, look, I don't care if you don't become, I do care. I want you to become scientists. But if you don't, if that's not your vocation, you are engaging the handiwork of God in a way that you've never done before. And I don't care if it's hard to balance chemical equations. I don't care if deriving physics formulas of motion are hard. Do it anyway because you've got the intellect for it and because God created a world that is that ordered. And you won't understand how ordered this world is until you put your pencil on the paper and wrestle with it. And so if you, even if you don't become a scientist, do that in your lifetime at least once. Because if you don't derive physics equations, it's like getting to the end of your life and never seeing a rainbow. It's that sad. <laughs> I'm serious. It's amazing to understand, even what you learn in high school. What you learn in high school took hundreds of years for us to figure out. And it's amazing that these things happen. I worked as a chemist, and it's not just pencil work on paper. When you figure out your calculations and say these molecules should do this and these atoms should do this and this pressure should cause this and I shouldn't blow up the lab if I do this, and then you do it and it works, it's like, hallelujah. It matters. And so, even, so a lot of my students left. They didn't hate science anymore. They didn't hate chemistry. They may not have become scientists, but one thing I promise you they will never do. They will never go out there and tolerate this conflict myth ever again because they know that science is the study of the handiwork of God. Biology students. <laughs> See photosynthesis over there on the side? And that's how, that's how trees are made from air, as uh, Richard Feynman once said. Trees take carbon dioxide and turn it into living things. They take carbon from the air, they turn it into the three carbon uh, precursors for biomass in the world. And it's a beautiful system how it all works together. Fundamentally, biology is just atoms and molecules doing their thing the way God created them. And I could talk much more about that, but I'll try to wrap it up. Um, I, I can go on and on about that, because once you get what I just said, my, my husband has had to pull me in out of snowfall up in the north in tears before. He's like, honey, it's a little weird. You need to stop standing out here crying. But look, once you understand that God holds electrons in their orbitals every nanosecond of time, that God created the world this way, that if, that if you knew all the chemical reactions that have to happen for you to take one more breath or for your heart to beat one more time, you would get down on your knees and weep for joy right now. We don't even know all the chemical reactions that have to take place. But you can stand out in nature and look around and see snowflake, snowflakes, you won't see it in Texas, but you do see it in New York, see snowflakes falling from the sky, looking at the stars beyond them. And it will move you to tears to think about what it means to say, thank you, God, for my existence. Because when you're looking at stars, you're looking at where the elements were first made. And they came to the earth, we think, some 4.5 billion years ago, and then life arose, and here we are. Like, what are the chances of that? It makes every moment of your life special. It means that us being here right now, God's handiwork is here. This, this is meant to be. Everything. It changes the way you look at your life. And it comes from our belief, our absolute belief in the one and triune God. One and triune. God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. No other religion has God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There are other monotheistic religions, but they're not triune. 
They're not Trinitarian. Why does that matter? Because that scripture I read before about wisdom. It wasn't just that God created everything and said, see y'all later. It, It was that God, the Father, and the Son, rationality, the Word, that logos that the Greeks talked about, It wasn't order in nature. It wasn't a living universe. It was the living Son of God who became man. That is the only way the universe could have been created. If the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is truly God and truly man, and God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all there at the beginning of time when creation happened, then the world could only be ordered. It's only befitting a truly rational son of God that the world would be ordered. The world cannot be random and chaotic. We can't have that. That does not fit our Christian worldview. Another scripture. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. That's Christ talking. Another from the Gospels. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Going back to ancient Greece, one more really neat thing. They had a word, monogenes. Did I say that right? Monogenes? Close enough. (laughs) M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S. It means only begotten. Unigenitas was the other word, and it meant only begotten. And the ancient Greeks, this is from Plato, talked about in order that the world might be solitary, like the perfect animal, the Creator made not two worlds or an infinite number of them, but there is an ever will and ever will be only one begotten heaven created. So they're, they're trying to get away from pantheism, but not. And he's saying the only begotten world. And again, the most perfect, the one only begotten heaven. Father Yaki used to tell a story. Imagine you're them and Christ walks into the room. Either the world is only begotten or Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, God become man, is only begotten. And if Christ is only begotten, only begotten of God the Father, the world is not deified. We do not worship nature. We reverence nature. We are good stewards of nature because it's God's handiwork, but it is not God. It puts science in its place, the Catholic worldview. And that's why science could only be born of Christianity. And it's why In the beginning, God created everything in Genesis 1-1, typologically speaking, to John 1-1. In the beginning was the Word, rationality. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's why St. John's Gospel has a very, very strong scientific significance if you understand the history of science properly. Moving from there very quickly, only to finish this circle, Galileo, after he, and and Dr. Hayes is going to talk about Galileo. After Galileo figured out we could quantify nature, he wasn't the first, but he's known for it. He called it the book of nature, book of scripture, book of nature. From there, science and philosophy became separated. That's part of the history as well. And this is something you say, and a lot more could be said here too, but I just want to drive home the main points. This is what leads us up to our modern time. Science was born of Christianity. They were intimately related. The worldview bred the ideas to quantify nature. But then something happened. That little baby born of Christianity started growing up. Science. Science exploded. And as people started figuring out because you didn't even have to be Catholic then to start doing science. Once it started figuring out how you could quantify and manipulate nature and, and medicine, and I mean medicine, they had medicine in ancient cultures, I don't want to suggest they didn't. But once we started quantifying and we figured out even better how to control nature, that took off like a firestorm. Descartes, who was Catholic, had used some language, and it wasn't just him, but this is just an example, 
that our knowledge of physics renders us lords and possessors of nature. There got to be a little bit of hubris there in the scientific mindset, that science can do a whole lot of things. And people started to say, well, maybe we don't really need, you know, this new way of learning about the world, maybe we don't really need philosophy anymore. Maybe we don't really need theology. Maybe the new knowledge is from science, because it was coming from science. His, his discourse on the method is actually discourse on the method of rightly conducting the reason and seeking truth in the sciences. See, there, there, there's a great reverence for science. And there should have been, and I'm saying this now so we can kind of understand our place in history. Francis Bacon also, we're up into the 16th and 17th century. In short, let there be one discipline for cultivating the knowledge we have, he's talking about philosophy, and another for discovering new knowledge, science, that's the cool one. And there became this divide that we are living in the midst of today. And that's where the conflict myth came from. And all you've got to do, everybody who's got one, hold your cell phone up. Cell phones, yeah. All you've got to do, does anybody actually know how those things work? <laughs> because that would make you get down on your knees and cry too, if you knew. <laughs> These things are working by radio waves shooting around the globe, and there's electrons running around in there, even when you drop it that do what they're supposed to do in these solid state materials that people figured out because nature is that, that regular, that routine, that ordered. We have mobile phones. We have global communication. We can fly from one state to another. We have medical technology like we've never had before. We have conveniences. We can come in and turn the lights on and do this, and my voice can carry. And we can drive in our cars. Modern science exploded, and it is good and right to reject scientism, this belief that science has all the answers. But it's also fair to say, of course that would happen. I mean, of course, over time, people would start to think that science did have all the answers. Which is why, in this day and age of very serious scientific questions, science is now at a spot, like, like Dr. Barr was talking about, we can do all kinds of things. And there are some people that say, just because we can do it, we should. No, no. We need guidance in scientific progress right now in understanding evolution, okay? Somebody needs to be out there saying, you know, this, this old creationist and intelligent design stuff needs to go away because what we need to be talking about is defending the dignity of the human person and the human soul. Fine, dig up fossils, do genetics, study all you want about evolution, come up with all the theories about how mutations hurt, occurred in natural selection, that's fine. But we need to be saying don't forget about the human soul because the minute people forget about the human soul, the human is treated as nothing more than an object. In genetics, in cloning, if the human doesn't have a soul and we're nothing more than an object, then you can kill embryonic children to use them for research. You can take the hearts and lungs and brains of aborted fetuses and use them in research because, hey, that's better than throwing them away. That is the logic in that bioethical field. You can treat the environment however you want to because let's just get through our life, who cares? You can splice together the genes of mice and humans and make whatever monsters you want. You can interpret neuroscience and say the brain is just, I mean, we're actually at a point now where a lot of neuroscientists say we don't have free will because our brains are just atoms and molecules doing its thing and we don't have any control over our thoughts and choices. And artificial intelligence. There are a lot, the only thing, I mean, I could say a lot more about those too, but there are serious things going on in the field of scientific progress right now. Atheists who love science don't know why. They don't know where they're going with it. They need guidance. Maybe you could even evangelize to them and say, did you ever ask how come everything is so ordered? And then maybe you can set down that atheist that loves science and lead them to Christ. Because true progress needs guidance. And it's happening now. The Pontifical Academy of the Sciences, they hold summits, they hold conferences, they hold teaching events. They teach on genetics, trafficking, organ transplant, health of people on the planet, 
um, people's well-being, the social impact of in innovative cr cancer research, personalized medicine, the origin of prehumans. These are things the Pontifical Academy of Sciences talks about. The Vatican Observatory has Vatican Observatory Summer School. They teach about evolution of stellar clust clusters, galaxies, um, black holes, gravitational waves. Stephen Barr, Society of Catholic Scientists, he's got over a thousand members and it's only a few years old. These are scientists who are working, who are practicing Catholics. They hold conferences on origins, the human mind and physicalism. What does it mean to be human? They hold gold masses around the country. The Nas National Catholic Bioethics Center publishes information. Their lead ethicist is Father Tad Pachosik. I can never say his name. Pachosik. He's a, he's a neuroscientist from Yale and a priest, and he understands these bioethical issues. There's all kinds of things going on. The John Templeton Foundation that helps make events like this possible. But Catholics are needed in the fields of science. So we know how to practice virtue. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. And you can't practice authentic prudence, justice, fortitude, or temperance unless you start from faith, hope, and love. We need the physical. We need the spiritual. It all fits together for us. So the point, if science was born of Christianity, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a mother and I have teenagers, science as grown up as it's become, and as independent as it's become, it needs to come back to mama. <laughs> it needs guidance from its mother, the church. So you need to help us complete the scientific revolution. It's happening now. Science was born of Christianity. Science exploded. Science, philosophy, and theology divided. They're coming back together in a mature way. So whether you love science, whether you're a citizen, a parent, an educator, especially if you're a student, first of all, entertain no more of this conflict myth. Second of all, go forward and lead the way. Evangelize through science. Atheists love science. Guide them to Christ through science. And if you're a student and you like science, please become a scientist. And don't you ever set your faith aside at that lab door when you go into it. You need your faith. Faith is not just something we think about on Sunday. Faith is how you live your life. Just like faith and rev revelation guided science, it guides everything you do. Every choice you make needs to be guided by your faith. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. That's what that means. Everything has to be guided. Will this get me to heaven? If I buy this brand of mayonnaise instead of that one, is that going to get me to heaven? Every little thing, you start to think about it in different terms. Because what we need you to do is finish completing the scientific revolution for the progress of humanity. We need true progress to be guided by Catholics who are scientists, who understand how to practice virtue, who understand that there was a beginning in time and we're moving to an end in time, and that the human person is body and soul with dignity from God. We need you to defend those things, or bad things can happen. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs>